May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Jonah, 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 what are we going to do with this man? First, he takes a boat literally to the other side of the world to get away from the task that God has given him. Then he gets swallowed by a fish, and now he begrudgingly is calling the Ninevites to repentance and sulking as they actually take his word to heart and do it. Jonah, while he may have been the most successful prophet in the Bible, the entire city repenting and sitting in sackcloth and ashes as a result of his call, is also the most resistant. It seems that when he finally does what God asks of him, he refuses to allow himself to be changed by the experience. He is there for the Ninevites because God is making him, and that is it. There is no reciprocity in his eyes, no work that he needs to do on his own soul. This was simply a mission to save the fallen in his eyes, people in his mind that didn't deserve a second chance anyway. Now, I will acknowledge that it had to be terrifying to be called by God and told that your job is to go into enemy territory and call the people to repent to a God that they didn't even pray to. In fact, he not only had to call them to reflect on their actions, to change their ways going forward, but also to accept and follow his God, not their gods. But perhaps, perhaps if he was really open, he might have noticed that this journey that he was called to take was not just for them, but for him too. And this is where I think the story gets complicated because we tend to focus on Jonah's resistance or on the great transformation and conversion of the city of Nineveh. But if we do, I think we miss the story's real star because I wonder if the real star of the story isn't us. Us, like Jonah, who sometimes want to control and contain God's love and decide who deserves it and who doesn't. The ones like Jonah trying to limit God's love, happy to accept it ourselves like him, but questioning who else really deserves it. Ourselves, like Jonah, sitting on a hill pouting when others who we don't deem worthy receive God's blessing. I mean, let's look at it. We repeat week after week about God's abundant welcomes, God's extravagant grace, God's forgiveness, which is as wide as the East is to the West. But then a real life situation arises and we quickly assume the chair of judgment. We sit like Jonah on the hill, just waiting for the other person to show their true colors. We, with a smile on our face, wait for some karma to come and make things right again from our perspective. But how do we align that with a theology that comes to us in scripture that says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, and it continues. It says, he came not to condemn the world, but to save the world. Theologian Todd Hobby says, the greatest block to spiritual health of congregations has to be the inability to embrace the belief that the grace of God is for all people. And that means all. The loud neighbor that cut down your tree, the driver who cut you off in traffic, the drug addict who's living in a flop house and stealing to feed his habit, the murderer on death row, the politician who puts his pocketbook before the poor. These are the hard realities of life. And I often have the theoretical and theological conversation with congregants about what they would do if they got to heaven and Hitler was there. Could they accept that somehow, somehow God's grace could reach even the worst of these? We seem to be able to handle the least, the lost, and the lonely, but the worst? 
the troubled, the difficult, the angry, the harmful? Can God's love reach even there? Will we allow it? Because in essence, that's what this story is about. That is who the Ninevites were. They were the annihilators of the early Hebrew people responsible for countless deaths and the abduction of many more. If Hitler were there in heaven, could we trust that God had entered in and changed Hitler's heart? Or would we find ourselves angry and resentful? And what exactly would our complaint be? How would his presence affect our presence there and the grace that God had offered us as well? See, this is the good news embedded within the construct of the Bible. We are all God's children. We all have potential. God loves us and seeks us continually, no matter how far away we have run, even if we're on our way to Tarshish, God will find us and draw us back. And who are we to say that such a calling ends at the point of death? Who are we to judge who God sees as righteous? We don't know the mystery of God. I know it's hard to hear, but we are not God. Let's be honest. Jesus' expansive love of those who others de deemed not worthy was the one thing that made the righteous elite so angry with him. They seemed to think that if Jesus was so important, then he should be hobnobbing with them and not hanging out with uh, prostitutes and lepers and tax collectors and Joe average people, let alone women. Ugh. They felt he should be spending his time with them. They wanted his attention and were frustrated when he shared it with others. And that isn't to say that he didn't share it with them. He went to dinner with them as well. But to share was to draw away. To them, elitism was about having all the resources, all the attention, that Jesus should have paid attention just to the few. But that's not how God's love and grace works. God's love and grace and forgiveness does not diminish when it's shared with others. It multiplies. God's grace is not a pie to be cut up. We don't have to worry if there's enough. Jonah was loved and forgiven when he ran away, and the Ninevites were also loved and spared of their calamity. Both can be true at the same time. One does not take from the other. When you try to imagine the expansiveness and abundance of God's grace and love and forgiveness, I encourage you to think of the baskets of leftovers that Jesus had after he fed the multitudes. What seemed finite, five loaves and two fish, became not only enough, but more than enough. There were 12 basketfuls left over. There were, in fact, more leftovers than they started with food. Now, of course, you're all thinking in your logical mind, well, that's all well and good when we're talking about things like grace and forgiveness, intangibles. But there is a limit to tangibles. If I brought to dinner two fish and five loaves for 50 people, people are going to be hungry and they're going to be upset. But see, this is where God's economics come into play. This is where our transformation becomes important because it is possible. I've seen it where food for two can be expanded to 50. We do it here all the time. It's called a potluck supper. We did it here during the tornado. There was nothing in these cabinets. I mean, maybe like cinnamon and an apple and a 50 pound bag of flour for pies, right? But we fed a town for months together with each other and ingenuity and trust and God, we always have enough and usually more than we need. This is an economy that I can get behind, that I'll bet you you can get behind. Last week, for goodness sake, we had a neighbor that most of you don't know, so I use that term lightly, who needed a burial. 
and I put out a call, and without question, you all gave. You all gave not just enough to bury him, but bury others beyond him. We had not just enough, but more than enough. Can you imagine a world shaped like that every day, all the time? Yesterday, I read an article in Sojourners magazine called God's Economy of Generosity, how the church can help reimagine the story of money by Jose Humphreys III. And he introduced the concept, and forgive my Spanish here, donde comen dos, comen cuatros, where two eat, four can eat. The idea being that scarcity is in our mindset, not an innate part of the world. In fact, Humphrey's entire thesis is that the way we currently interact with money is based on an illusion that we have been sold and that we have bought into, which both emphasizes limitedness and feeds our unending demand for it. He even goes so far as to ponder who is behind such illusions. Who is selling us this bill of goods? And he encourages us to consider how they might be benefiting from us taking that storyline hook, line, and sinker. Because he says the other alternative is in fact our story of faith that we carry with us, which teaches us that there is enough, always enough, when we are willing to share God's blessings and participate in God's generosity. Every worship, we sing together these words, right? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. And we, like Jonah, therefore, have a choice to participate in that flow of blessings, or we block it up. See, Jonah had a justifiable reason to be angry at the Assyrians, a justifiable right to be frustrated, to be called to this task which benefits people who harmed his own people. But to have cause doesn't mean it's the good or the right thing to do. It also doesn't mean it is our job to exact retribution. And if I've learned one thing in my years, it's that love is far more transformative than judgment. Sadly, when we sit in judgment like Jonah, the only transformation that happens is in our own heart. And that transformation, well, it isn't very good. At the end of the book of Jonah, God asks him two different times, is it right for you to be angry? And sometimes we have to ask ourselves the same question because jealousy rises up easily especially when it's disguised in righteousness. And we really cannot help the feelings that rise up in us, but we sure can stop ourselves from acting on it. We sure can ask ourselves, is it really right for us to be angry about this? We live in a world where another person's gain often feels like our loss, but God's economy doesn't work like that. We live in a world where we want to met out blessings based on worthiness. But God's love doesn't work like that. We live in a world that wants to withhold forgiveness until a person has proven themselves. But the good news is that God meets us in our pain, in our suffering, in our mistakes. And God says to us, oh, my beloved child, come with me. Let us leave this place together. Let me live in you and you in me. I know it's hard for us to imagine such a generous love is possible. It is hard for us to accept such a gracious reality. And yet, that is what our faith calls us to do, to not only accept it, to know that we are loved, but to participate it and share in all that we have with others, to meet people where they are, and sometimes to go where we don't want to go, and to delight with our siblings everywhere in the abundant pleasures of the world and God's love. 
See, I wonder if we took these ideas of God's generous love and wrote an alternative ending to Jonah, what might it look like? Would it end with him sulking on the hill like we saw in the picture when Ryan was reading? I mean, what if, as he walked through the town, seeing their repentance and the change that was taking place in their hearts, what if he joined them? What if he sat down beside them, maybe started to teach them more about God's ways that he had experienced? What if he began to share his own story of transformation? What if he dared to listen to them about their process of transformation? What if he let them change him? Unfortunately, we'll never know, because that's not the path that he chose. Amen.